Takedown at the Leafs game this weekend under review and hotly debated. Well, that's very excessive from what I saw. You're going to let him up and he's going to continue. you got to stop him. Was this knee to the head maneuver too much? We'll explain what the video shows and what police allege happened right before the camera started rolling. And they waited almost eight months before they can trigger an alert to let me know that um, I owed them that much money. Plus, forced to pay thousands seemingly out of nowhere. A CBC Toronto investigation finds Enbridge customers caught with hefty back payments. How you can protect yourself. As soon as you walk out, it's like it hits you right at one time. So people's lives are really at stake here. And threatening thermometer. What the city is doing to help vulnerable people during this week's deep chill. Good evening, I'm Chris Glover. We begin tonight with that security incident from Saturday's Leafs game. Video of the takedown shows event staff kneeing the man in the head while he's being restrained on the ground. Toronto police say the video misses alleged actions from the man prior to the video starting and have since charged a Hamilton man with assaulting a police officer and three security guards. Dale Manukduk joins us live from outside Scotiabank Arena tonight. Dale, take us back to Saturday and what we've learned about this case. Well, Chris, it happened during the Leafs 5-3 loss to the Avs just before 10 p.m. Security went to go check and see if a man was doing okay. Now, police say that the guy got confrontational with security and then allegedly assaulted three guards. Now, a police officer came to arrest the man, and again, allegedly, that man assaulted a cop. What's interesting about the video that's been going around social media is it doesn't show any of these alleged assaults. What it does show is the man being brutalized by event staff. This video captured on Saturday has been viewed thousands of times online. The man in the blue suit repeatedly dropping his knee or shin onto another man's head. Moments later, his head is pounded onto the ground near what appears to be a small pool of blood. The video posted online doesn't show what happened before. I'm showing you a snippet of a video. That's very excessive from what I saw. Allegedly assaulted three Wait, security guards. Once and a he's on the ground, that's excessive force. You don't need a knee to the head. I used to do security. You don't need a knee to the head. Put him down the most calmest way possible, but if someone's retaliating and they're going to hurt more, and you're going to let him up and he's going to continue, you got to stop him. Toronto police have since charged 37-year-old William Anderson of Ancaster with three counts of assault and one count of assaulting an officer. If it ever did end up at a trial, we have to remember that in Canada, the courts have already ruled that people are not expected to act to a level of perfection when using force. Looking at only that video snuff, but it would suggest that the force would be excessive or extreme. This former Toronto cop was also an instructor at the Ontario Police College. Not only at one point would have placed his knee, but he transitioned. He moved that, I think, two or three times, maybe three times. Uh, so it wasn't an accidental placement. That is not a focus point of subject control. Why? Because it leading an individual to injury. Last month, in a separate, unrelated incident, video from a pro-Palestinian protest captured a police officer appearing to place his knee on the neck and head area of a demonstrator who allegedly shoved the cop. Toronto police initially said there was no knee-on-neck tactic used and have since said the appropriate amount of force was applied. But police and security guards aren't subject to the same training. They're two totally separate entities, sir, not to be confused with one another. Security provision does not require a legislated um, laid out training program to meet any particular standard, not in this, not in this province anymore. Uh, Chris, most of the people I spoke to tonight agree that what they saw was excessive force, even with the context that this man allegedly assaulted three guards and a cop. It's unclear if the guards will face any discipline for their actions, but MLSE does say that it's conducting its own investigation. As for the Hamilton man, William uh, Anderson, he's going to be in court on March 12th here in Toronto. Chris? Dale Manukduk reporting live for us tonight from outside Scotiabank Arena. Dale, thank you very much. Next to a CBC Toronto investigation into complaints against Enbridge, several people say they received bills out of the blue, some totaling thousands of dollars. The concerns stem from a lack of regular meter readings by the utility company. Sarah McMillan shares their story and how you can protect yourself.
Next month, this is going to get tucked onto our bill. It wasn't the holiday gift Kareem Gurgis was hoping for. On December 27th, he got an email from Enbridge saying his account had been billed incorrectly and he owed more than $1,600 in natural gas he'd used. They explained that they hadn't been able to get into my backyard to do a meter reading and my backyard is locked because we have a pool um, and they waited almost eight months before they can trigger an alert to let me know that um, I owed them that much money. Gurgis said he had no idea just how much gas his new pool heater was using. Enbridge hadn't checked his meter since April, so for eight months his bill was based on estimates. I honestly didn't scrutinize my bill when it comes to utilities as long as it looks kind of status quo, like the same as it's always been. We just pay our bills and move on. Enbridge is allowed to rely on estimates sometimes. Ontario's energy regulator says all gas utilities are supposed to get meter readings every two months. However, for the last several years, the number of Enbridge customers going months on end without an actual reading has been well above that standard. Like making a photocopy of a photocopy, your estimated bills get more and more inaccurate. In 2022, Enbridge was fined a quarter of a million dollars after a review by the Ontario Energy Board found it wasn't meeting certain customer service standards, including meter readings. The Ontario Energy Board says no more than half a percent of customers should go four months in a row without a meter reading. But for the last several years, Enbridge has not come close to meeting that standard. Just last month, the Energy Board rejected a request by Enbridge asking to permanently lower the standard to no more than 2%. Meanwhile, the number of complaints to the Energy Board related to meter readings has more than doubled since it launched its review with 87 complaints last year. I paid off, I guess, 4,000 there. CBC has spoken with several customers who've gone months without readings and later had bill shock with catch up bills ranging from a few hundred dollars to several thousand. I don't know how they do that. Ingrid Roadsip got a bill for more than $7,000 just over a year ago. This whole thing made it made things a lot more difficult, uh, not just financially, but also um, emotionally and mentally. She now submits her own meter readings each month. That's an option advertised by Enbridge, but which advocates say is no replacement for the company doing its own readings. What happens to the disabled person? What happens to the person who doesn't have access to technology? Enbridge declined CBC's request for an interview, but it said in a statement that it is making strides to improve its performance. The Energy Board says it expects Enbridge to provide a plan for how it will meet service standards. Sarah McMillan, CBC News, Toronto. Regardless of meter readings, a lot of us can expect to spend at least a little bit more on our hydro bills for this week. Frigid weather is gripping the GTA at times like tonight. It's going to feel around minus 20 with the wind chill. But the city's warming centers and shelters are at capacity and advocates are once again warning homeless Torontonians are in danger. Talia Ricci has the story. For some, spending time outdoors in the bitter cold weather is an intentional choice. It's been pretty lovely, a little cold, but uh, yeah. we've been enjoying, enjoying being out and about. As soon as you walk out, it's like it hits you right at one time. So, but, it, but I'm enjoying it though. But advocates say for those experiencing homelessness, it's a threat to their survival. So the risk of harm is actually very high and so people's lives are really at stake here. Frigid temperatures first arrived over the weekend, at times feeling like minus 20 with the wind chill. This as vulnerable people struggle to find spaces in the city's overwhelmed shelter system. Um, I know somebody who rides the subway to stay warm throughout the day and as long as they can at night. People are going to the mall, to the libraries. Some folks are sitting at the um, hospital emergency rooms just waiting for, for an option. The city says warming centers opened last week and they remain open. All four of them were at capacity throughout the weekend. The city says it has adjusted the threshold for when it opens the warming centers, but advocates say they should be open the entire season. Today, Mayor Olivia Chow toured Covenant House, the largest agency in Canada serving youth who are homeless and at risk. Their services are stretched too. Last year we saw a 60% increase in the number of visits to our drop-in centre and a 30% increase overall in youth showing up at our doors needing emergency support. And this year, we're seeing that trend continue. Chow says the city is working to open more shelter spaces and build affordable housing as quickly as they can. We've never had 
so many people living in shelters. We have 10,000 people. So for us, every day is a challenge because we are creating more and more, whether it is respite center, more warming center hours, uh, more shelter beds, everything. And we just keep expanding. But with freezing cold temperatures expected to stick around in the coming days, many worry about those who are outside. And at the end of the day, like, I worry for people who are sleeping outside um, because every year we know that people freeze to death. Um, and I wonder if this is the week where we'll see somebody else die. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Here's what that dangerous cold looks like right now. It's minus 11 degrees, feeling like minus 15 with the wind chill as we look live at the city of Toronto. Victor Paolo is here with the first check on the forecast. And this week's weather really slapping us in the face, Victor, especially after the first part of this winter. Chris, you know, we're talking about how warm it was in the month of December, but January is here and January is coming with a strong statement. January said we're bringing rain, we're bringing snow, and we're bringing Arctic air to remind you that winter is a month of coldness here in January because you got that Arctic air mixed with the strong winds and we do have snow coming our way. Average temperatures time of year, minus 2.2 is your average high and minus 10.6 is your average low. And taking a look at the system that's coming our way and to see exactly when and where, this is right around after the show. As you can see, it's going to be getting more cloudy and that's where the scattered snow is going to start coming from, which eventually by the time it's the morning will turn into proper snow. And by the time it's going to be the morning, how cold will it be with all that snow? Well, when my little Emmy and your little ones are getting ready, it's going to be minus 12, feeling like minus 19. And looking at our three-day forecast, one thing I can tell you, it's going to be a cold and snowy Tuesday, followed up by a bit of a sunny but cold Wednesday and the return of the sun on Thursday. Over to you, Chris. All right, we'll be ready. Thank you, Victor. A small plane had to make an emergency landing on the road in Ajax tonight. It happened near Bailey Street and Audley Road. Durham police say the plane's engine failed. Tonight we spoke to a couple who was driving in the area at the time and watched the whole thing go down. The height of the plane, there is no doubt that there was a problem and he was looking for a place to land. I said to him, you don't know how lucky you are. <laughs> because we expected to turn around and find a crash site. My heart was beating very, very quickly. <laughs> Lucky, no doubt. All right, so the couple snapped this picture after checking that the pilot was okay and then going on their way. Police confirming no injuries were reported. The plane, though, and a few light poles were damaged in that landing. A significant change is now in operation for Ontario long-term care homes. The Ford government opening up a new investigations unit and introducing stricter penalties. Empowered as provincial offences officers, their specialized training will allow investigators to lay provincial charges for the 11 offences under the Fixing Long-Term Care Act. All right, so the offenses covered by the act include failure to protect residents from abuse or neglect and failure to comply with an inspector's orders. The minister says the new unit won't replace the work of the existing inspections program, but will work in tandem with it. The 10-person team is now active, and the cost of the unit is pegged at $72 million. Ontario's largest child care provider is warning that some not-for-profit centers are at risk if the provincial government doesn't change how it compensates them under the new national $10 a day child care program. That we have 35,000 licenses currently. We only serve 19,000 because we don't have the human resources and funding required to fill the existing spaces. The plea from the YMCA comes as the province seeks to significantly boost the amount of child care spaces. The fees parents pay for child care have been cut in half, with the provincial government replacing that revenue. But the YMCA says it's leaving many operators with deficits. Now, spokesperson for Ontario Education Minister Stephen Lecce says the province is pushing for more federal money. There are more questions being raised about the provincial government's plans to open service Ontario locations inside some Staples stores. Kiosks are being added so you can renew your driver's license or health card at the big box store. And the government says it's considering expanding to other stores as well. Lorenda Redekop, our Queen's Park reporter, has all the details. 
Along with the office and school supplies, some Staples locations will soon have kiosks so you can get a health card or renew your driver's license. Opposition parties raise concerns about this happening without a bid process. Speaking on CBC Radio's Metro Morning, the minister responsible defended his government. This type of contract is typical when governments enter into pilot projects. That's what this is with Staples. It's a pilot project that's beginning early this year. He says a big reason Staples was chosen was access to parking and longer hours. As for what happens when the pilot project ends? If it continues to provide service excellence, then it could become permanent. But at the same time, we're continuing to have dialogue with other potential retail partners to uh, consider whether we want to expand that model. And City News reports Walmart is one site where the government is expanding, with two of its stores set to have a Service Ontario location. In a statement, the province says no new deals have been finalized and that locations in staple stores will need a 30% increase in operating hours and will save almost a million dollars compared to the sites in local stores that will close. The government needs to be transparent here, particularly we're hearing more than one company is involved. That sounds to me like a lot more than a small pilot project. In this online job posting for a Staples manager, it lists converting Service Ontario traffic to drive sales and profitability as a requirement. Ontario taxpayers shouldn't be subsidizing uh, sales and marketing efforts for a big box store, U.S. owned company like Staples. It's just wrong. You've already been able to go into some Canadian tire locations and visit a Service Ontario kiosk for years. They're also in some IDA pharmacies and home hardware stores. But this latest big box expansion, as kiosks in local businesses close? Really question what the government's priorities are here uh, and, and how they came to this decision. They should be transparent uh, and they need to be more accountable clearly to the people of Ontario. While the government calls the Staples move a pilot project, it never used that term in the initial news release announcing this last month. Lorenda Redicon. Welcome back. The province's police watchdog is investigating a pursuit in Mississauga. The case involves a vehicle that collided with a city bus at Dixie and Burnham Thorpe around 4.30 this morning. The special investigations unit says a Peel officer had attempted to pull the driver over, believing it was a stolen car. The SIU is investigating because as the driver allegedly sped off, they hit a My Way bus, leaving the 18-year-old driver with serious injuries. Peel police, meantime, have not said whether there are any charges pending against the driver. A new study tonight showing the dangers of Toronto streets. The research found over a five-year period ending in 2021, cyclists in the city made roughly 30,000 ER visits, far exceeding police data for that time period. Clara Pasica explains what's behind the discrepancy and what some say needs to be done about the overall problem. So the first column is the police reported injuries. The second col uh, the column is emergency department visits. And you can see that the police reported make up about 7.9%. Researchers found during a five-year period from 2016 to 2021, there were some 30,000 emergency department visits for cyclists. Yet Toronto police data doesn't reflect most of these injuries. Though the discrepancy is huge, this researcher is not blaming police. Police data are never intended to capture all injuries, and that's why it's important to use various data sources in this type of research. She says the findings emphasize the need to link health services data and police data to inform road safety planning, something her team did. Be a great next step is to look at exactly what the circumstances around those injuries were. University Rosedale Councillor Diane Sachs says too often cyclists suffer injuries without an impact from a vehicle, and it's clear the city needs to make roads safer. We adversely affect people's lives and all of these accidents are a real sign of that. Um, you know, we have people who've fallen off of, off their bike and had totally life-changing injuries from, from brain injuries through no fault of their own. And we make that more and more likely every time we skip on maintenance. She says the clear next step is for the city budget to properly invest in safer roads. Unless we change how we manage, uh, yes, it is going to keep getting worse and worse. The data has cycling experts concerned about the parameters police use to count an injury as involving a vehicle. So think of all the other people who've had near misses uh, that uh, resulted in an injury who were refused um, by police for 
for a motor vehicle collision report because they don't see it as being a collision. That could be a reason uh, behind some of the numbers. Toronto police pointed CBC to their public safety data portal, where people can now more easily self-report. Clara Pasika, CBC News, Toronto. The bitterly cold weather is certainly one of the top stories of the day and the week, really. So let's get back to Victor Paolo with details on the long-range forecast. Taking a look at the map of North America here, we'd just like to point out, and I know last week we're talking about the weather. We mentioned how a lot of this purple and a lot of the blue was mainly over Alberta, mainly over Saskatchewan. But you can see a lot of that Arctic air has found its way all the way down to the Cowboys, icing them out all the way down in Dallas, Texas. Whew, what a game yesterday. Now, also you can see over here towards southeastern Ontario, the cold air has finally reached us here in Toronto. Why do I say it's reached us here? Well, look at the temperatures tonight. Not only will there be some scattered flurries behind me, but you can see as well it's going to be minus 13, feeling like minus 20. Make sure if you are in a vehicle tonight or if you're traveling, you have that emergency kit in your car with some blankets. Way we can stay warm in case you got to have a little bit of an extra weight before emergency services can get to you. It's always better to prepare when the temperatures are this cold. And don't forget to bundle up if you do step outside as well. Now, how much snow are we going to be expecting? Well, between now and let's say early Wednesday morning, we're expecting anywhere between one to four five potentially but really it's going to be like a one to three centimeters we're expecting here now when it comes to the weather that's coming our way here's what it looks like when we slow it down and blow it up you can see overnight tonight into tomorrow morning there's going to be that one to three centimeters that's going to be happening especially around nine o'clock eight o'clock in the morning when your commute starts so understand that the roads might not be favorable and the commute might be a lot slower than expected and if you do got to walk to school or walk your little ones to school as well just be prepared for the sidewalks as well to not be in the best shape with all the snow that's falling so early in the day now, later on, as we get in towards your Tuesday, the sky will start to clear up a touch as we get closer to Wednesday, because Wednesday is the day we're going to be seeing some sunshine. As you look at our three and seven day forecast here, minus 19 start to our day after that minus 20 overnight is what it's going to feel like. And then you got some sun returning on Wednesday and Thursday and looking at Friday, Saturday, Sunday and Monday, you can see that the temperatures on Saturday are going to feel like minus 17. But by the time we get to Monday, it's going to feel like minus seven. Toronto, stay warm and stay dry and have yourselves a great night. All right, Victa, thank you. So the message is bundle up and be safe out there. It's certainly very cold. That's our show for you tonight. Thanks for watching. I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.